And uh, if you take a look, say, at the climate change issue, uh, there's enormous propaganda, which incidentally is quite public. They openly announce it by the major business lobbies, Chamber of Commerce, which is the biggest one, and others, to try to convince the public that none of this is happening. And that there's a lot of propaganda coming out. Uh, the media repeat it, and uh, people are either confused or they begin to ask whether it's really true. Uh, this is part of an anti-science wave. Why should we believe the scientists? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, all of this is combining, it's converging, it's uh, giving a kind of vicious cycle which uh, leads in extremely dangerous directions, unless it's aborted. You know. Well, one of your most famous books is uh, Manufacturing Consent, the book on the, the media. What about the, the role of the media? It's, well, you know, take, say, um, New York Times, you know, major newspaper. I mean, it debates climate, it, it does publish the opposing views on climate change, more or less equally. So on one side are, you know, 99% of the scientists. Uh, on the other side are uh, uh, some crazed senator, Jim Inhofe, who says it isn't happening, and, you know, half a dozen scientists who they can pick up, as you can on any topic. Well, the public reads this, and it's, uh, it's kind of he said, she said, you know, yes. two views. Uh, how do we make up our minds? Well, why should we trust these people anyway? Yeah. Well, that's what the media is all about these days. That's what's called... It's, he, he says... We, yeah, we, except, we, see, there's an there's a underlying principle. If you go to a journalism school, the best journalism schools, you're taught a concept of objectivity. You have to be objective. And objective is defined. Uh, if something is being discussed, what they call within the beltway, you know, in the Washington system, uh, if it's being discussed there, like if it's disputed by Republicans and Democrats, you got to report both sides accurately. Uh, suppose you have a view that's not in the Beltway. Well, if you report that, it's biased, it's sentimental, it's uh, not objective, and so on. So take, say, climate change. 98% uh, of the scientists happen to be outside the Beltway. Uh, and this is true on many other issues. I mean, let's go back to the deficit for a minute. Uh, I mentioned that about half of it is due to military spending, which is just outlandish. The United States spend about as much as the rest of the world combined. But the other half is more interesting. The other half is traceable to the completely dysfunctional health care system, which is an international scandal. It's privatized, it's unregulated, and it's about twice the per capita costs of, say, European, other industrial countries with some of the worst outcomes. Well, it's been calculated by some good economists that if the United States had the same kind of health care system that, say, um, France, Germany, other Western countries have, uh, not only would there be no deficit, there'd be a surplus. But that's not discussable inside the Beltway because it affects the power of the financial institutions, the insurance companies and so on. It happens that a large majority of the population has favored it for a long time but it can't enter into the political system. You could see it in the debate on the health care reform the last couple of years. Uh, the idea that you should, uh, a, a large part of the public depends on the poll, but quite a large part, often a majority, wants a national health care system. Uh, that's not even discussed. Uh, Obama did have a, there was a proposal, the Democrats had a proposal to allow what was called a public option so people could choose to join Medicare, you know, the general health care system as a choice. They wouldn't have to go to insurance companies. It was supported by about two-thirds of the population. Obama just dropped it. He didn't, it was, you know, he didn't say to the public, okay, you want it, I'm going to push for it. He said uh, essentially to the insurance companies, I'm not going to allow it to happen. So it's, you don't even have the option. Well, that's the deficit. That's why I say if they wanted to tame the deficit, which is not a high-order problem. Unemployment is the high-order problem, um, very serious problem. Uh, they could, but it, it doesn't fit the needs of the people who Adam Smith called the masters of mankind, the people yeah. who own the economy. I'm going to ask you a large question, which is basically what, what in your view, are the largest problems facing humankind? Humankind? Yeah. Well, I think that's easy. Yeah. Uh, there are two. Uh, we're, we happen to be at a stage of history which is unique. Uh, 
we have the capacity to destroy the, de the species, in fact, or at least decent life for the species. And there are two major uh, aspects of this. Uh, one, which has pretty much been around for 50 years, is nuclear war. It's a kind of a miracle that we haven't had a nuclear war. If you look at the history, it's come very close a number of times. Uh, if, uh, in fact, it's being, and it's being increased right now, the risk. I'll talk about it if you like. But uh, it's real. Maybe it's not a high risk, but if you have a low probability event that's continually recurring, the probability that it will happen is very high. Yes. So there could be a nuclear war. That's one. And that one we know how to deal with, at least in principle. The other is environmental catastrophe. I mean, the International uh, uh, Energy Agency just a couple of weeks ago uh, came out with an estimate of uh, greenhouse gas emissions last year, highest ever, even though there was a recession, so less manufacturing. But more significantly, they, they estimated that uh, it's reaching uh, the point of uh, probable raising of global temperature, say, within the century by two degrees centigrade. Well, that's what the scientific consensus has argued is the threshold. If we get to that, it may be irreversible. And we're verging on it. Yeah. Now, you know, that's not going to de destroy all life, but it could very well destroy viable existence for much of the society. I mean, these are huge threats. You are giving a lecture in, uh, in Iceland. Uh, what will you be speaking about? I was asked to speak about 9-11, uh, naturally. Uh, and I'll speak about, actually the title gives it away. Uh, the title that I submitted is uh, The Two 9-11s and Their Historical Significance. And there are two. I mentioned them. And they each have historical significance. And it's also significant that the West only recognize one of them. That's also significant. Uh, it uh, grows out of a long imperial history of centuries, and it's very dangerous. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what the alternatives were, which I think were real, and how the... Uh, I'll also talk about the uh, uh, Osama bin Laden assassination. Yes. Uh, you know, it's a very unpopular position, but I, I think it's a crime. You know, I don't think you assassinate suspects, and he is a suspect in Western systems of justice, in theory at least, until a person is sentenced, he's a suspect. Now, he could have been apprehended. Everyone agrees to that. He could have been apprehended, could have been brought to trial. Uh, he wasn't. The choice was made to assassinate him. It was a planned assassination. He dumped his body in the ocean, no autopsy. Uh, uh, that's guaranteed to increase uh, anger and skepticism in the Muslim world, yes. just on obvious rational grounds. You know, why kill him and dump his body in the uh, uh, ocean? Well, the natural conclusion, which is, well, a lot of people believe it already, is they had no evidence. Uh, so, so the action was undertaken in a way which increases the belief that Osama bin Laden really wanted to implant, that they're trying to destroy the Muslim world. They're attacking Islam. Uh, did you at all follow Iceland's predicament after the uh, the collapse? Were we some people say that we would like the uh, the sort of the canary in the coal mine, that the one that sort of fell first? Yeah, it's also interesting the way pa Iceland responded to it, essentially refusing to pay the debts. That's what it amounted to, and of course that that's the second country to have done that. The first was Argentina, around 2000. They were they had followed. IMF rules, they were the, you know, the poster child, done everything right, uh, lauded by all the economists, and the economy totally crashed because it was completely unviable. Uh, they couldn't, if they'd paid off their debts, they'd be one of the poorest countries in the, in the world. Instead, they essentially defaulted, they call it restructuring, but essentially said, well, we're not going to pay, and they've been doing fine, so with the highest growth rate, one of the highest growth rates in the world. Yes. Uh, it's uh, Isn't not, that what not recommending it, no. but it's an interesting, no. yeah. interesting observation. Yes. Uh, and uh, 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 the policies that Iceland was following were totally mad. 
I mean, I think that's now recognized, so I don't have to argue it. But they were based on crazed free market illusions, which made absolutely no sense, and of course burst. And Iceland is not the only one. I mean, the same happened in the United States. Uh, during the last 10 years, uh, I mentioned that when Clinton left office, there was actually a slight budget surplus. Uh, uh, that disappeared with Bush's fiscal measures, riching the rich and, uh, and the military expenditures. But there's something else that happened. Uh, a housing bubble began. Yes. And there's a reason for that. Uh, people, it has to do with the stagnation of incomes. Uh, people's wealth, such as it is, is in their houses for most of the population. And house prices started to go up, and there was predatory lending. You know, the, the lenders, the banks, uh, they figured, okay, we'll lend money freely even to people who can't pay for it. Then they carry out what's called securitizing the mor mortgages. You divide the mortgages up into, you know, a thousand pieces, and you sell them off to somebody else, and uh, the hedge funds come in, and you get end up with some arcane system which nobody understands, and it's not even clear who owns the mortgage. And they figure that if it all busts, the government will bail them out, which is in fact what happened, which just encourages more of this behavior. Well, the housing prices started to skyrocket. Uh, there's about a hundred years of records of housing prices and they pretty much track gross domestic product or close to it. Uh -huh. Around 2000 it started taking off uh, way beyond uh, 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 gross domestic product. Uh, th there was no economic reason, there was no fundamentals behind it. In fact rents stayed s stable, that's what you ought to measure it against. So if any economist had their eyes open they would have seen that there's something deeply wrong with this. A few economists did, a handful. Almost all didn't, because they are in thrall of a religious fanaticism. It's called the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, markets are efficient, period. And therefore, if this is happening, it's got to be efficient. So the, the Fed, you know, Federal Reserve, Greenspan, Bernanke, uh, with the support of almost the entire economics profession, said this is fine, can't be anything wrong with it because whatever market's doing must be right. Uh, Iceland is similar. Markets are saying it's fine, so it must be okay. Uh, you ended up with an $8 trillion bubble, which burst, means that $8 trillion of wealth was lost suddenly. Well, you, you know what that does to an economy. It also helped to bring down the world economy. You know, other similar things were happening. Uh, I mean, there's a real fundamentalist faith. It's kind of like Christian evangelical faith. Yes. And it's kind of interesting that even after it, the whole edifice collapsed, mm -hmm. it's still maintained. The faith is still there. The faith yeah. is still there. Yes. Well, Professor Chomsky, I know you will also be speaking about linguistics while you're yes. here. When you are, you're one of the most influential linguistics of, uh, of all times. But well, we're you. not going to discuss linguistics here. Thank you Thanks. for being on this program. Glad to talk to you. Mm -hmm.